In this example, we're asked to analyze the rotor blades for an Apache helicopter. We're given some information about the helicopter, so how fast the rotor's spinning. Of course, it's spinning in air. Uh, the cord length of the, uh, the, the blades of the helicopter. The cord, cord length is this distance right here, just from the leading edge of the blade to the trailing edge. And we're told that the blade extends a distance of 7.3 meters from the center of the rotor hub. And we're greatly simplifying the problem by assuming that the plates, the blades can be modeled as very thin flat plates at zero angle of attack. So no lift is generated. It's not a very effective helicopter the way we're modeling it here, but uh, you know we're just trying to do a simple back of the envelope kind of analysis. So part A of this problem is asking is at what radial distance from the hub is the flow at the blade trailing edge turbulent? Let's just do these one at a time. So let me tackle that problem first. So the idea is this, that we have this flow, the blades are spinning, but let's put ourselves in the frame of reference of the blade so it looks like there's flow coming in to our blade here. And I want to know at what distance r from the center of the hub the flow is turbulent at the trailing edge right there, at the, at the very trailing edge. So to find that, uh, what we'll do is, since we're trying to find out when the boundary layer becomes turbulent, this is a calculation for determining when we hit that critical Reynolds number. We recall that the critical Reynolds number is 500,000. That's the transition from a laminar boundary layer to a turbulent boundary layer. So we're going to um, calculate at what distance from the hub center will hit that critical boundary layer thickness. So, or hit that critical boundary layer um, value of 500,000. So the Reynolds number will be the velocity of the incoming air times, so th that's this velocity up here, capital U, times the distance at the trailing edge. So we're going to call this distance um, for the cord length, we're, we're, we're just going to call it L, divided by the kinematic viscosity of air. Now the velocity coming in will just be R times omega. Omega is the rotational speed of the blade. So R times omega. And we know L, so let me put some numbers down here. So we know L is 53 centimeters, so 53 centimeters. We know omega is 200 RPM. The kinematic viscosity of air was given as 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5 square meters per second. And then we can go ahead and solve for R for those conditions. So we want to know when that Reynolds number hits 500,000. And when you solve, when you plug in the numbers and do some unit conversions, you'll find that R comes out to be 0.68 meters. So it's really not that far, actually, from the hub of the blade. So you can see that the whole blade length is 7.3 meters. And, you know, just over half a meter into it, we go from being laminar to at least some portion of the blade being turbulent. Okay, so that's part A, is to find that radius. Okay, so part B is, what is the 99% boundary layer thickness at the blade tip trailing edge? So what we're talking about there is all the way at the very edge of the, the rotor blade, what is the 99% boundary layer thickness at that tip? So now out there, we know that the flow is going to be turbulent, right? Because over most of the blade, we just found the, the boundary layer will be, in fact, turbulent. So to find that boundary layer thickness, what we'll do is we'll use our turbulent boundary layer correlations. And so we know that delta over x is equal to 0.382 all over the Reynolds number based on x raised to the 1 -fifth power. That just comes from our lecture where we derived correlations for turbulent boundary layers. And again, we know that at the very blade tip, it's going to be turbulent. Um, the distance x here that we care about, that's the distance from the leading edge. So it's in fact our cord length L. So let me do some rearranging here. So this will be 0.382 all over the Reynolds number um, based on L, since X here is really our L. So what I mean by that is X is measured from the leading edge. Sorry about that. Let me draw that a little bit better. So X is measured from the, the leading edge, and we just want it right here at the very trailing edge, which we said was our distance L. 
So we have delta is equal to 0 0.382 over the Reynolds number based on L to the 1 -fifth. That's from our uh, turbulent boundary layer correlation. And then I'm multiplying through by my x, which in this case is L. And our Reynolds number based on L will be the free stream velocity at that location times our distance L divided by the kinematic viscosity. And our velocity way out there at the blade tip will be the full length of the blade, let's call it capital R, times omega, which is the rotational speed. So R here is our 7.3 meters. The, the omega we already said was 200 RPM. L we said already was 53 centimeters. We already said what the kinematic viscosity of air is. So we can go ahead and plug in all the numbers here. And when you do all that, you'll get the 99% boundary layer thickness is 9.1 millimeters. So just less than a centimeter thick all the way out there at that uh, trailing edge of the blade. All right, so that's part B. Now for part C, we're as told to assume that the flow over the entire length of the four blades is turbulent, which is actually not too bad of an assumption since, since it's only you know just over uh, two-thirds of a meter that's laminar. You know, over the rest of the blade, some portion of it's turbulent, so it's not too bad of an assumption that, that most of the blade behaves um, like it has a turbulent boundary layer. So we're going to just assume that the entire length over all four blades is turbulent. We're asked to estimate the power required, required to drive the helicopter rotor. So we're just going to base that on skin friction drag. So that means we're going to have to find the drag over the whole um, you know, over the whole rotor and specifically find the power as a result of that. So the way we'll do that is we'll just take a look at one little bit of the blade. So let me just do that down here since it's getting a little messy. And I'm going to find, since, since the velocity changes over the entire blade length, right? So I'm going to just look at some small, um, just some small area here. This, this distance will be dr because it's some small distance in the radial direction. Again, this distance is L. So we have some small area there. I'm going to find the drag acting on that little bit of area. Find the torque caused by that little bit of drag out at that radius. And then multiply that by the angular speed to get the power. Okay, so I'm going to write this all down mathematically, but hopefully we can kind of follow that logic. So that little area is just some distance r from the hub center. Okay, so let me find the, the drag force on that little, that little bit of area. So that'll be the drag coefficient, which we're going to treat as being turbulent, times the, free stream, uh, the, the dynamic pressure based on the free stream, times the little bit of area there, which will be L times dr. So that'll be the drag force on that little area, but keep in mind that we have a, a top and a bottom to these blades. So I'm going to multiply by 2 to get the top and bottom. So I'll just make a note here, TB for top and bottom. And the drag coefficient for turbulent boundary layer flow will be 0 0.0742 all over the Reynolds number based on the length L raised to the 1 -fifth. That comes from our notes for turbulent boundary layer correlations. And we'll also keep in mind that the velocity u is actually our distance out to that little area, which will be r times omega. That whole thing is squared. And then times L dr, which is our little bit of area. OK, so again, just to kind of recap, the 2 is because we have a top and bottom face. That expression I just underlined there is our drag coefficient for a turbulent boundary layer. The r omega is the velocity of the air coming into the blade at that point. And just keep in mind that varies with radius because this is a rotating uh, helicopter blade. And then that's our little bit of area that we're dealing with right there. So that'll be the little bit of drag force on that little bit of area. And to get the torque caused by that little bit of drag force, that'll be the moment arm r times that little bit of force. Df. And if I want to get the total torque, 
what I would do then is integrate over that whole blade. So I'm going to just go as R goes from 0 to capital R, so from the hub all the way to the end. There's my moment arm R, my top and bottom faces, my drag coefficient for a turbulent boundary layer, then here's my dynamic pressure, keeping in mind that the velocity varies over the length of the blade times a little bit of area. And I guess I should also just point out that the Reynolds number based on L here is just this expression right up there. So you can substitute that in. So we would have to perform that integral. And um, before I do that, let me just say one other thing. This is the torque. This will be the total torque caused by one blade. Right? I, all I've done is just focused on this blade right here. But keep in mind there are four blades. So I should really multiply this whole thing times four because there are four blades. So we have to account for that as well. Okay, well we can go ahead and plug in the values for that, do the integral, and when I do that integral, it'll, it's gonna be kind of messy looking. Let me go ahead and just give you the full expression here. It'll be 7.81 times 10 to the minus two times the density of the air, which will be 1.23 kilograms per cubic meter times the kinematic viscosity raised to the one-fifth power, times the angular speed of the blade raised to the nine-fifths power, times the length of the cord length of the blade raised to the four-fifths power, times the length of one of the blades, one of the helicopter blades from the hub to the tip, raised to the 19 over five power. Kind of strange numbers because of the way the integral works out. But that's what the torque comes out to be. And when you plug in the numbers, it all comes out. I don't actually think I plugged in the numbers for that one. Oh, yeah, I did, I think. Just give me one second here. Yeah. So when you plug in the numbers, it comes out to be 2,790 newton meters. And then if you want the power required to overcome that torque, it'll be the angular speed omega times the torque T. So... We said that the angular speed was 200 RPM. You'd have to do the conversion to make it radians per second. But when you work this out, it comes out to be 58.3 kilowatts, ultimately. So that one's a, uh, you know, a little more complex kind of calculation. Just to kind of recap what we did to find that, that power is we found the drag force on a small area of one of the blades. And we, the reason we have to do it over a small area is because the velocity is changing over um, each part of the blade surface, right? Because it's rotating around, the velocity up here changes as you change the radius. So that's why we had to look at the drag force on one small little area. So we had to do the drag force on one small little area, taking into account the top and bottom surfaces of the blade, noting that we have a turbulent boundary layer and then we found the torque caused by the force on that small area. That's just the moment arm R times a little bit of force DF. And then to find the total torque, we have to do the integral as we go from the hub all the way to the tip of the blade. And then we multiplied it by four because there are four blades. And then to find the power required to um, drive the rotor, we have to multiply the torque times the angular speed omega. So that is the, the power, assuming that we're dealing with flat, uh, you know, flat blades. Obviously, in a real helicopter, those blades will have some angle of attack. And so they'll be tilted with respect to the incoming, um, you know, free stream velocity. And so they'll, you'll also get what, what's known as form drag. There'll be some drag due to pressure effects. Uh, what we calculated here was just drag to, due to wall shear stresses or skin friction effects. But when the blades are tilted, you'll get some pressure effects that contribute as well. So the actual power will be larger than what we calculated here. In fact, the number we calculated here is really kind of a minimum power. Um, the real power, of course, will be much higher because of the form drag effects. All right, we'll go ahead and end the 